So I'm going to reintroduce Lynn. She's my co-presenter for these sessions. She also was very, uh, she essentially put this book together for us. So I'd like to thank Lynn for all the time and effort she's put into that. And <clears throat> I think that you'll find this book very helpful. I think that you, hopefully you'll be able to take it home with your notes, bring it to IEPs with you, discuss it with, you know, with people and, and ask more questions because um, there's, there's just a small fraction of what, what you could know and there's, it's relatively impossible for us to, to go over everything uh, related to special education law in just a one day session. I think it would take us you know, roughly 40 to 50 hours yeah, of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about session two in a couple of ways. We're going to do it from the parent's perspective. Lynn is a, is a parent of a child with autism and she um, is also a, an advocate and, and runs uh, the local TACA, Talk About Curing Autism, a parent support group, uh, very active in the autism community in, in California. She runs the Central California um, a, a division of that, uh, that organization. So we're going to talk, talk about uh, introduction to IEP strategy. Okay, let me go to that. Okay, the first thing that I want to talk about is kind of the insider's view of this. Because a lot of times when I talk to parents, they don't have a full understanding of what's going to happen. And that's what, we're, that's, and I want to talk about that from a certain kind of way. And why we're here today is to really focus on strategy, okay? Because if you don't need strategy, I mean, the reason that we do that here is because all this information that we're going to tell you on a straightforward basis, it's already out there. You could Google it, you could buy the complete IEP guide or anything that's specific to your state. But what we want to talk about is the information that's not there. And of course, I'm going to talk about it from the parent perspective because when I first started out, I had no idea what to do and it was really frustrating. So the one thing that I want to talk about first is that it's not necessarily a linear process, okay? Because if you were to buy, which I consider to be a great book, The Complete IEP by, Guide by Lawrence Siegel, often they present you're going to be successful if you do A, B, C, and D. And sometimes parents do that and then they call me and just say, it just blew up in my face. I did everything I was supposed to and they just said no. Okay, so what happened? Well, we need to talk about the, what you can do differently to size up your own individual process, okay? Because following the linear process does work for some people, but some of you have really complicated kids or a lot's already happened. Your child is nine or 10 and things haven't gone well. So just starting with, um, you know, the A, B, and C isn't gonna work for that complicated thing. The other thing is if you want to be successful, with the process, you have to really understand it. Because I haven't found any parents who don't understand their child's rights who have good programs. And of course, you're here today, so you're going to learn quite a bit about that. But I also want you to control it. I want you to be making choices. Because when I talk to a lot of parents, the worst thing that's happening to them is that this whole thing is just happening to them. And they're just in tears because every time they feel like they feel like there's going on, something worse happens and they feel like they're not, not only is their child not moving forward, but they're not moving forward in what's happening with their child's program. Okay, so you have to understand that. Now, one thing you have to realize is districts cr create lots of procedures that are designed to fail, saying, well, you have to have a signed IEP before we can, before we can assess for ABA, as if there's like this thing that's called the ABA assessment and they give different names to all these different processes of all the hoops you have to jump through so you can have an ABA assessment or what we do for an age. You have to remember lots of those things. There's no legal basis for it, okay? So that's one of the reasons why you've got to control the process is to know that that process that they've created is completely artificial, okay? There's nothing in the law that says you have to have a signed IEP or you have to have this or that before you can assess a child for the ABA needs. If your child has autism, they should have thought about doing a behavioral assessment in the beginning. That's not something that happened, happened later. And the other thing your district wants to do is two different things, and I love this analogy because I'm a foodie, I love, I love, love food, is they want you to go down the cafeteria line, okay, and pick out what you want. And if you don't like it, the answer is you go hungry. Don't want mystery meat? You don't want jello for dessert? Sorry, lady, we don't have anything. But that's not how federal law works. Federal law is supposed to be cooking from scratch. You figure out what it's going to be, you might need some recipes, you might need to go shopping, and if you serve it to your child and he throws it up, 
You're not going to keep trying to feed it to him, okay? Even if you cook from scratch, you can experience failure. But if you're cooking from scratch, you learn from your failures, and you go back and you do it a little bit differently. You don't get back in the cafeteria line and say, of, hey, he didn't like the meatloaf. Let's try giving him more meatloaf to see if he doesn't throw it up, because that's not going to work. The other thing is to be the detective and ask the obvious, especially jargon. Um, one of my favorite websites is rightslaw.com, and there's an advocate on there. Her name's Pat Howie, and she talks about acting like, I hope you guys can remember this, from the 70s, there was a show about a detective named Columbo, and she talks about taking the Columbo perspective and asking all the obvious questions, because a lot of parents get shut down by, by what districts tell them, so you need to ask them, well, how do you determine if a child needs an aid? Can you describe a child to me in the district who has an aid. You say my child's too severe. You say my child's too whatever. Because a lot of times people will, parents will come to me in tears saying, you know, my district said that my son is too severe. And one thing I want them to understand is that was a fill in the blank, okay? Because Susie's mom came in in tears because they told her that Susie was too high functioning and Johnny's too severe. And Jose, well, he doesn't have any behaviors, okay? A lot of what you're saying, you have to realize, is a template, and it's not really about your child. Um, the jargon is really important, because I think when I've gone to IEPs with parents, that that's deliberate, okay? I mean, some of it's comfort. You hear of saying FAPE over and over, but they do lots of things. And for tests, I've never even heard of, not that I'm an expert on testing, but you have to make everybody say what it is that they're talking about and explain it to you, because you are the most important member of the IEP team. And for you to get, give informed consent for the IEP, you have to understand all of it. So everybody should be happy to be there as long as it takes to explain to you what you don't understand. The individualized approach. That's something that goes, kind of goes back to what is linear and what's not linear. Is to Sometimes people don't understand, well, you did that for your son, but why wouldn't we do this? Well, because there was a different set of circumstances. There are sometimes, with some districts, it's great to be the passive aggressive. You're going to give your district just enough rope to let them hang themselves. If they're going to do, because this is what happens, some people are just saying, you know, you know, they came out and they did an assessment and it was 15 minutes and it was this and it was that. And my advice usually is let it be 15 minutes, okay? It's going to be much easier to overcome the truly horrible assessment. But if you help them and you make it a mediocre assessment for them, that's a lot harder to overcome, okay? So we talk about sometimes it's great to be the aggressive parent that's going to do everything and make everything align because that fits that child and it fits that district. There's going to be other parents where we're going to say, let's just let it happen. And we're going to let them do a terrible job going to the IEP. And that's when we're going to say, a 15-minute assessment for speech, you didn't actually do any testing because you thought my child wouldn't participate, we need an independent assessment. The next thing is looking for leverage. You know, a lot of times parents don't understand, you know, why does Spencer have a really great program? And he's in the same district as Beatrice, who has a totally crummy program, OK? Well, because in Spencer's case, we found leverage. When the document review was done, we found the district was out of compliance and all these things. So going to negotiations, Spencer had a great case. In Beatrice's case, everything was in compliance. The parent didn't have as much leverage. So we go through that process. And that's why there's a certain path for different children, not just based on the child, but what has happened so far? The next thing is, you know, we already heard it once this morning, and we talk about this with the group that I have that um, does new parent seminars, and I tell people in the very beginning, when I do my whole spiel on legal issues, 90% of your questions, all I'm going to say in, the, in response is, get an independent assessment. Because parents ask me over and over and over, how can I get more speech? How can I get more hours of ABA? You know, the blah, blah, blah about the OT, the physical therapy, the APE. It's very, very difficult to get the district to move on things without some professional saying, this is warranted for this child. Because in most cases, your district doesn't really care about your opinion, OK? You're unqualified. You're overly emotional. And what do you know anyway, OK? So keep thinking that. You're going to need somebody else to give an opinion. The next thing is, if you really want to understand this process, my number one advice is to go to an IEP with another parent. You'll do two things. You'll support that other parent, and then you can understand that process. It's kind of like when you were in high school and you were taking Spanish or French or whatever, a lot of times, all of a sudden, you understood things about English that you've never paid attention to in terms of structure, 
because you learned it from birth, okay? Well, when you go to an IEP, it's all about your child. It's all about how much you love your child. It's all about, for a lot of us, trying not to cry when somebody's telling you that your five-year-old has the speech abilities of an 18-month, okay? It's hard to be thinking strategically when it's all about your child. But if you were to go to another parent's IEP, you're actually watching what's happening. You're watching another parent who, in your opinion, just went by something that might have been a good option because it was too emotional. So if you want to understand it, go with someone else. And the other thing is consider all the reasons why you would want an attorney. A lot of times people ask me, well, this is what I want, this is what I'm thinking, and realize there are certain situations for which the attorney will bring in a lot of leverage, okay? And will allow you to do things you couldn't do otherwise. I mean, as soon as you have, a lot of times, Parents come to me with terrible problems, and the district is just going to let the process go until the kid graduates from high school, or until he's 22, or whatever the exit age for your state, because there's no pressure on them. Whereas when parents bring in an attorney, it's not so much what the attorney's going to do, it's ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. The district realizes somebody's working at an hourly rate, and if you were to go to due process, they might be on the hook for all that, okay? And the other thing is, attorneys often can negotiate outside an IEP. Okay? which that doesn't typically happen with parents. It's kind of like in, when people get divorced. You know how sometimes attorneys can talk to each other when the two parties, it's become really hostile? Okay? Those are the, some of the things, that, and there's, there's, we, could, we could have a whole session on why you use an attorney and what it is, but I just wanted to explain these things in terms of the process to give you insight as to the rest of things. So the rest of this, Tim and I are going to go back and forth because what we hope to present to you is the parent's perspective and the attorney's perspective. Because a lot of you and most of the parents that I represent, the vast majority will not get legal rep representation. So what we're talking about is how they can advocate on their own. And I can tell you, I got a lot of experience at IEPs without an attorney, okay? And then Tim's got all the experience for what this whole happens when you have an attorney on your side. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so prior to the IEP meeting, what is some, what, one of the most basic, basic fundamental principles is understand that if you're going to communicate with the school district, make sure it's in writing. I can't tell you how many times I talk to parents and they tell me the school district made all these promises to me and I don't, I don't see them anywhere in the IEP, but I know they told me that they would give my child X, Y, and Z. And, I just, and, and now nobody remembers that. Okay, so you go to the IEP, and all of a sudden, everybody just you know, forgets what, what promises were made or uh, what assessments they said they could do. And what usually has happened is you know, maybe the person that talked to the parent has, has spoken to a supervisor, an administrator somewhere in the district, and they've been informed that, no, that's not something we do in our district. That's not our policy. Okay? And you're going to hear that a lot in this presentation. Um, when does the school district's policy control? Well, in many cases, it doesn't, okay? It, it's really just, it may not even be a policy that's in existence. It might just be uh, a custom or tradition or you know, misinterpretation of the law. Um, and that's somehow uh, promulgated and, 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 uh, and discussed as a policy when it's not in fact the case. And then also, make it what's called a letter to a stranger. Sometimes even when parents do write letters, They'll show it to me, and I read them, and I said, I, I still don't know what you're talking about, okay? You, this, you know, your letter says, remember when I talked to you about Emily's problem on blah, blah, blah? Well, that still leaves it open to interpretation. You need to say back, remember, you told me that you thought Emily needed an aid, and I told you that was a good idea, and we agreed that blah, blah, blah. So what you're really doing is actually restating. And if somebody calls you on the phone in response to that letter, you're going to write another one and say, Dear Mrs. Jones, thank you so much for calling up. I'm really relieved that you're going to do an assessment for Emily on this date. Okay, so keep thinking letter to a stranger because some of you may end up in due process or you might just use it as leverage because maybe you'll go up the chain of command and show it to your superintendent and say, look, these are all the letters. You're not in a good position. Please deal with me. And you also want to keep in mind, not only may it go to the superintendent, but if you ultimately end up in a dispute with your school district and you have to have to uh, go back and discuss the timeline related to your child's case, you might need to present this to a judge or hearing officer. And that person 
is a stranger to the case. This person knows nothing about your child and you're giving them a very finite period of time to make um, what you hope is a good decision and the right decision. Okay, so it's important that everything, every communication you have uh, is in writing. Now this is not meant to, to make you all paranoid about what, you're, what you have to do. It's just, just cover all your bases. Uh, just like you would um, treat it more like, just try to be as objective as you can. And it's hard to be objective because this is a very emotional process. But it, you, if you put it in writing, it's going to be a lot easier for you later. Also, keep a copy of all letters any notifications, whether it be hard copy or whether it be email. And in our electronic age, there's a lot more emails going back and forth. Don't delete them, okay? I know that a lot Back of them up, print them out. Make sure that when you, cut, when you get it in, if you're the type of person that doesn't like clutter and you want to delete the stuff on your mailbox, if you use webmail and you can't really, you know, file it somewhere or save it somewhere, just print it out and make a folder. Get yourself a binder. Starting from day one, if, this is a, if, if your child hasn't yet been determined eligible, you're transitioning into the IEP process, make a, child for your, or make a binder for your child, print out the copies of any correspondence, make a correspondence section, and just you know, put it in chronological order. It's going to be a lot easier to follow. And, and, and trust me, if you get to a point where there's a dispute, and many of you will get to that point, uh, if, if you ask for a service that the school district refuses, then you're going to want to go back and use that at some point, and your, your attorney or advocate will love you for it. It's going to be a lot easier to put on a better case if you've got it all in writing. Okay, so structure the IEP meeting. We're going to go over the process, starting with number one. Districts are required to ensure that you meaningfully participate in this process. IEP, this Individualized Education Program, meeting between school district officials, parents. Vince said you're the most important members of the team. That's absolutely correct. This process, this process is in existence for you, okay? The school district is required for you and your child to talk about your child, but it's really for, to allow you an opportunity to talk about what your child's needs are. And if the district it gives you the impression that they run the show, that, that's absolutely incorrect. They have a duty to ensure that this process runs smoothly they have to facilitate it, they have to coordinate these meetings, but they need to cooperate with you on dates and times, they need to give you adequate notice, 24 hours, phone call, not adequate notice, okay? They need to give you some reasonable notice in advance, they have to give you written notice, usually comes in the mail, putting it in your kid's backpack, and sending it home is not adequate notice, okay? Um, I can't tell you how many times that school districts have said, well, I put it in Johnny's backpack, and it's not my fault if the parents didn't get it. You know, it's, it's not adequate. They need to put it in a letter to you, put it in an email to you, confirm that you got it, and it make be, sure... It would be so shocking for an autistic child to tear something up that was in their backpack. Right. <laughs> if, if this is something that they don't do, is it something that you need to do in your You could, and we'll, we can talk about more specifics. There is a... It, it's a procedural violation. The school district's required to give you notice of an IEP meeting and you have, they have to cooperate with you on attendance at that IEP meeting. And under certain very limited circumstances, the school district can hold an IEP without you. But don't let them abuse that, okay? Very limited circumstances. In fact, they have to move heaven and earth to make sure you're there at that IEP meeting. So what we hear districts doing all the time, at least in my state, and I don't think it's different in other states, is if you don't attend on this state, we're gonna hold it without you. So whether you're here or not, we're gonna do it on this state. That's all about their convenience, okay? You are the most important member in this process. We're talking about your child. And if you're not there, it, it's, 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 it's absolutely not going to be an effective discussion. Okay, so them checking off a procedural box saying that they held it by the annual review date is not as important as ensuring that you're there at that IEP, okay? And another thing that, I, that I, we pointed, we're going to point out is that be sure to tell them if they, and I, I just got an email from a client last night saying that the district says I, like he gave them alternative dates to hold this IEP. He couldn't have it on the date they proposed. District says, um, we're going to hold it without you. Be sure to tell them that you don't consent to that, okay? Be sure to tell them that you absolutely do not consent to them having an IEP without you or your representative in attendance. And make sure that when you, when you want to reschedule a meeting, give them some alternative dates. 
All right, just tell them I, can meet, I can't meet on this date. You don't have to go into a lot of details. The district is not required or had, doesn't have any right to know your personal or professional schedules. This is, it could be very personal. Districts are going to ask you lots of questions sometimes. Why can't you go? Well, you know, you can, you can send the same questions back to them. Lynn will tell you a story. Yeah, yeah we got one of those last week, um, or a couple weeks ago, from my son, from the superintendent, saying, well, why can't you? You need to tell us all the reasons why you can't be on this date and whatever suggestions you have so we can make this happen by the end of the year. So I sent the same letter back to her. Dear, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I can't make it on those dates. Can you tell me why your staff can't make it on the dates? And can you tell me your suggestions? You know, I sent the exams. So I'm sure it was really irritating for her to get that same letter. But I have no more of a right to know. What is it, a doctor's appointment? Is it an annual exam? Please tell me why. You know, that person is, that, that woman is not available on that date, okay? I'm not going to share any information. Plus, I have found that sharing information doesn't help. When I told them I was really sick and there's no way they still went ahead without me. So it's not like if I had pr presented more personal information that anyone would have really cared. It's a harassment technique, okay? So after that, we were able to come to what's supposed to be a mutually convenient time for um, both parties. Don't, yeah, don't, don't let them intimidate you into having the IEP on a date that's not convenient for you. Uh, don't put the ball back in their court. Just as Lynn did, you can send the same question back to them. They need to. And remember that. A lot of our strategy and a lot of things we'll talk about is how do you put the ball back in their court, okay? Because we can come back to that on different points of lots of things. When somebody says, you know, we just don't know what to do with Johnny or with a blah, blah, blah point. Well, let's figure out how to put the ball back in their court because it's not for you to have to make some of the determinations for them. Okay, parent procedural rights. They have a duty, the district, to give you a copy of your procedural rights and safeguards at least once a year. Typically that's given at an annual review because they're required by law to hold an IEP at least annually, okay, under the current law. And also, when you get those parent rights, don't take them as the gospel, you know, because I've gotten those parental rights that come from my county office of education, and they have specifically interpreted things and answered things in what I would consider to be really tricky wording. So if you see stuff that doesn't seem right, like this whole write-up on what they don't have to do if your child is privately placed, and we're going to talk about that in another section, realize that a lot of that stuff has gone through their filter, okay? So please do read those parental rights, but realize that they're not necessarily, they didn't just write down the law, they took down, they wrote down their interpretation of the law, which may or may not be lawful. And school districts, even though have a duty to explain the rights to you, they're probably not the best source of explanation, yeah. okay? All right, so don't take it as Lynn says, gospel. I would investigate it. I would talk to a, an advocate or an attorney that understands special education law. I see we have a question over there. If we can ask you just to hold the questions until the panel discussion, we're going to have it right at 11 o'clock. If we have some time at the end, which I don't think we will in this session, to, to address questions, we'll, ask, we'll address a couple. But I appreciate all the questions, and we're going to answer all of your questions. Uh, if we don't get to you, then uh, I'll give you an email address again so you can email me your questions. So, if you don't understand your rights, you can ask questions. I would encourage them, encourage you to ask them. Take notes, but don't take it as gospel. All right, just take notes and say thank you very much, and do do your own investigation. Find out if what how he explained it is really the truth. Okay, because school districts are going to tell you all kinds of things, and it's not always because they're lying to you. It could be because they just don't understand it. A lot of them okay? have no just, clue. You know, They've never read the complete IEP guide either. They don't know. And keep in mind who's writing these, the description of parents' rights. It's district lawyers, lawyers that just represent school districts. Very rarely are they going to have a panel of attorneys <laughs> that right. determines what the rights or how the rights should be written. It's going to be the people that work for them. And so it's going it's to be a tad bit skewed or a lot skewed towards, um, towards the school district side and, and sometimes very confusing. Determination of eligibility. Districts are responsible to assess in all areas of suspected disability or suspected need. Okay, so if there is an indication that your child has a need that hasn't been a, as properly assessed, even if your child is already eligible and already has an IEP, 
then you should notify the district that you feel my child has, I think my in child In writing, has, please. Exactly. Remember, in remember, writing. Anytime you we say notify, we're always going to assume that it's in writing. And don't, don't assume that they're just going to take your phone call and get right on it, okay? Sometimes, even if it's in writing, you have to get back to them two or three times. And again, you're, you've got a paper trail, so in case you have to file a complaint with your State Department of Education to enforce your rights to get an assessment, then, then you have some documentation to show that you've made these requests, okay? Because this is really frustrating for a lot of parents because they will have told somebody, I really think that Susie needs OT, okay? Well, then it doesn't get done. The IEP comes and, you know, there's nothing there. And the district says, like, oh, you wanted an OT assessment? Well, then now the district has 15 days to give you an assessment plan. And then once you sign it, then they have 60 days to do that assessment and to hold that IEP. So you just lost potentially two to three months of time, okay? And if it's at the end of the school year, like now, the, the, st the clock's going to stop ticking on the last day of school, and it's not going to start again. So that's another thing to make sure that you do do it in writing so you don't go to an IEP and have to start the clock all over again. There is some debate on that. I'll tell you that the 60 days is a relatively new thing um, in the IDA. So there's some debate amongst courts and states about um, whether the 60 days continues through the summer. I think that a lot of school districts are taking that position. Um, Lynn had mentioned that it stops at the last day of school. And some, it, I would just, I, some districts, whether or not it stops, they're going to tell you it stops at the last day of school. So I think pra their practical approach to it is they probably would not want to do an assessment and have their staff stay during, let's just say, during the break period. May, not all of you would be or necessarily on a traditional school year. Some of you may be on a, a, a round, year round school year. It's very popular in some school districts in California. Uh, and if it's, but if it's a traditional year, I would say get your assessment request in in writing. Um, and get that assessment plan from the school district and make sure it's accurate and it describes the assessment area of need that you're asking them to assess and get them a signed consent to that so they can do that assessment. And then we'll talk about what happens if you don't like it because then we, we go into the independent evaluation discussion which is our next session. <coughs> Reviewing the report. So once you've got that assessment in hand, what's next? Well, the school district has a duty to sit down with you at an IEP meeting within that 60 days and talk about the reports and discuss the, the findings and conclusions that were drawn as a result of those reports. Okay, so it's very important that you do participate in that IEP. But if you don't, if you don't understand, or you, don't, you don't agree with, or you, you, just, you, have, you, you think that the, the report is in some way suspect, or you're questionable, you have a right as a parent to, to seek an independent educational evaluation. And in many cases, that could be at school district's expense. Now, we're going to talk about this. I think we're going to, some of these things we're going to repeat over. You do want to get those reports in advance. And as far as I'm concerned, at least from what I have done, that's a good time to ask your questions because most districts don't put any recommendations in there unless it's like something really that would describe anything. Oh, structured preschool for Susie. Like there's unstructured preschools where they just let, you know, the kids run crazy. Um, so what you, ideally you're going to get your report in advance and then I, before I had an attorney helping me, I would call each one of those people and say, what, it is, what is it that you're going to recommend for my son, okay? Not that I could necessarily change their minds, but at least I could go into the IEP knowing that the school psych was going to do this, what that, and meanwhile I could read up so I could say like, what's your basis for wanting floor time or for doing it for, for that many um, hours? And keep in mind that not all school districts are going, as Lynn said, to give you a recommendation that makes sense. They might just simply say, this child is eligible for speech and language services. What does that mean? They might say this child is eligible for services in an amount to be determined appropriate by the IEP team. Well, in a, a language-rich environment. Yeah, is that, a, is that a, an ad, accurate statement? Well, yes, it's an accurate statement, but as a professional, the therapist or the psychologist or whoever's making the recommendation, the behaviorist needs to make a specific recommendation to the IEP team so the IEP team can make an informed decision on what's appropriate for the child. All right, so that is a basis, in my opinion, in and of itself, for you to get an independent educational evaluation. There is no specific recommendation in the report. If it just says your child's eligible but doesn't tell you what that means, I explain to parents all the time, it's like going to the doctor and them telling you your child um, or your, 
you, you've got a, 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 some sort of ailment, like you, you're sick and you've got pneumonia, but not giving you a prescription on how to handle that. They send you on your way and they tell you to talk to your insurance company and they'll figure out a way <laughs> to fix it. Well, that's not, that's not appropriate. I think most people would consider that malpractice. So um, you, you have to, the school district has a duty and their staff have a duty to make a specific recommendation to the IEP team. It's not up to the director of special education or the superintendent or the assistant superintendent or the principal. The speech therapist or the OT or the psychologist are there for the, for the purpose of discussing what their thoughts and opinions are about this child's needs and to make a recommendation. And sometimes they, they may want to wait till after the goals discussion um, and, and, dist and there's, there's a procedure to go through when you're talking about before you get to the placement and services recommendation, you have to identify needs and talk about goals and, and then you can talk about placement and services, but they can still make that recommendation to the IEP team and it should be in writing, okay? So I think, I think the practical reason why it, it oftentimes is not in the report is because districts are sometimes fearful that they're gonna be locked in to that recommendation and, and they wanna make sure that their supervisor supervisor has approved that expenditure or that therapy service or they have enough staff or whatever their practical or administrative convenience reason is to, it, to make sure they're not, they're not gonna put themselves in a bind, okay? Okay, so let's talk about how do we get to, how do we get to a, a determination of, of what the child's needs are? Well, we have to review the assessments and the assessment should really reveal what, where is the child currently performing in this area of deficit? We need to identify before we even get to goals and before we, way before we get to services and appropriate placement, where is he currently functioning? What is this area of deficit and, and, and how do we measure that? We have to know what the, the, the baseline is so we, we know where to start these goals. Once we've established this baseline, this present level of functional and academic performance, okay, and we have an idea specifically in each area of deficit that's been acknowledged by the IEP team where that child is, is currently performing, we're then able to structure goals as an IEP team. Now, we used to say goals and objectives, and some districts still use objectives. Districts are not federally, or they're not legally required, at least by federal law, to, to establish incremental objectives but some districts still, still want to use incremental objective in that, and that's fine, I think they're very helpful. Um, but annual goals at the very minimum is what, are what school districts must include as part of the child's IEP. And remember, anybody can write goals. You can write goals, okay? <laughs> and you can have, often most valuable, have somebody else, have the expert. If you're going to get an independent evaluation for speech or OT, whatever, don't go with somebody who's not willing, who doesn't have some educational experience and can write some goals for you and will attend the IEP, either in person or on the phone. And they don't have to be there the whole time. Like we have one, like we had one with Dr. Fosnott, where we said at 11 o'clock, Dr. Fosnott will be on the phone, she'll present her report, and she will answer all the questions. And in terms of strategy, that's really important because that changes everything. Because I can't go head to head with my SLP because I'm not a speech pathologist, okay? I don't know all those terms. I don't, didn't know what to say when she said, oh, there's no research supporting fast forward. Because Dr. Fosnott fielded that and said, well, you're wrong. And these are the studies from Stanford and whatever other prestigious studies that support fast forward. And this is why it was specifically would remediate this deficit for Spencer. And this is why it addresses an area of a need, okay? So if we're not gonna use fast forward, and this comes from the attorney part of it, then what are we going to use to take care of this area of need, okay? The other thing about goals is that watch out for these. Bobby will express happiness four out of five times per week. Of course, this, of course, that's a really crummy goal. But remember, sometimes what they'll do is in within that, they'll say 80% of the time out of four out of five times per week. Well, you know, I'm not really good in math, but I want you guys all to do the math when you get those. Because what you can end up, I remember somebody posted the other day and they did the math, they're all, wait a minute, that's only doing it 43% of the time. Why could you say that if my child did that 80% of the time, three out of five times, I can't remember what it was, um, and I had never thought about that before, because my district doesn't write them that way. Um, and I was shocked. So you gotta look for all that tricky stuff when you're doing the goals and objectives. And if you have a goal that your district doesn't wanna do, you can follow up after and send a letter, and we'll talk about this, and it's in your book, the, um, the CFR 
for prior written notice, you can write a letter with all the goals you propose. And if you go to rightslaw.com, they actually have a spreadsheet showing you how you can submit it to your school district. You can make a list of all the goals they didn't want to do and say, I'm asking for prior written notice. I want to know which goal you're going to accept, which goal you're not going to, the reason why or why not, and if yes, who's going to implement, who will be responsible for, OK? Because your district cannot just say, no, thank you, to a goal you propose. If you um, make a request for prior written notice, they need to write back and say why it's not warranted for your child and what else they considered or all the reasons why. And that's part, again, the strategy, putting the ball in their court, making the district go on record. You're entitled to why. They, they say that isn't the right goal for Bobby or why it's too far ahead of her. You can go back to your experts because you know a lot of times they'll say, um, oh, well, that's too advanced. Or if it's a maladaptive, all kids do that. Okay. Well, you, need, you want them to put in writing because it might be true that all kids do some things. But for our kids, it's the sum of all the weird things that my son does. <clears throat> it's not just that one thing, because all kids do something, right? Let me, let me explain something that's very important. I want you to take notes on this, because it's, it's important to know that unless you have goals in an area, you're not going to be able to get services. And yes. I have parents that talk to me all the time saying that I feel strongly that my child needs four hours a week of speech therapy, but the, district, you know, the district's not going to provide it. And we look at the IEP, and the kid's got one speech goal. There's no justification. If goals drive the placement and services, there's no justification for an in, that intensive a program, say with a child with apraxia, who needs a four, four to five hour a week of intense one-to-one -one instruction by a speech pathologist. If you got one goal, it's probably going to be hard to convince the school district. They're not going to tell you that. But if you, if you address the areas of deficit with goals and more goals, the more goals you have, the more likely you are to intensify or increase that service. because. The school district's obligation is to help the child make meaningful progress in achieving those goals within one year's period of time. They're, they're going to tell you, well, it's not a contract. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to ensure that he meets that goal. Well, they have to, they have to do something to, to help that child make progress, and that would be providing a, a level of intensity uh, that, that <clears throat> that's going to help that child achieve the goal. <clears throat> yeah, and we, we talked about objectively measurable just just make sure that you know, it's, you've, got, you've got some way to, to understand. You've got a baseline for each deficit area and some way to understand if he's exceeded that baseline or if he's regressed okay, by the next IEP. And if you're not very, very important. If you're not comfortable with writing goals on the internet, there are just millions of them. There are so many goal banks that you can go look through and see which ones are. I mean, I would rather that you had somebody help you. Uh, now, the one thing for speech and language is often to get that, um, you can get that covered by your insurance or OT. So you can often find somebody who can at least <clears throat> help to guide you through that process and make them measurable and make them finite. Because sometimes they're so long, they put so much in one goal that I look at and I think, even if this was my kid, I, couldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to be able to tell you whether or not he's actually achieved that goal. Okay, so moving on, moving on to offer replacement and services. The comment I've made here is don't put the cart before the horse. You have to discuss goals, present levels of performance, current levels of functioning, get a baseline for the area of need, develop the goal, and then after we have at least discussion, you may not have agreement on the goal, but the district would have to make an offer of placement of services. So once we've got the goals at least discussed in place, or if you've submitted goals for, for IEP team consideration, use that as a basis to discuss why your child needs a particular placement or, or a particular set of services. Because remember, they've always, you know, it's just whether they do it, obviously, they've always predetermined, OK? If you, in most cases, I would have to say the IEP is a pretend process. Everybody acts like, well, we'll have to see what the IEP team says. Well, everybody already met without you, whether you'd like to think of it that way or not. Everybody knows what's, you're the only person who doesn't know what's going to happen that day. Okay, so that's what you're up against, being so prepared that you could actually get someone not to agree to it, but change what they were already going to. Because a lot of times we get stuff that says draft on it. Well, it's not a draft. Those were the services. That's what it was. So you have to, like he said, come up with a rationale so you can say, how can you fill up those many, um, that many hours for your child? Certainly if the district walks into an IEP and hands you a list of services and placement, that's very problematic. The school district, it's absolutely illegal for a school district to determine the child's placement and services before you 
walk into the IEP. Now, what they do is cleverly write, like Lynn said, draft on the top, and at the end, they'll cross it out, <clears throat> and they'll, they're going to tell you, in many cases, it's just a draft, this is just our discussion. We, the IEP team can decide whatever it needs to decide based on what we feel the child's needs will require and what's appropriate for this child. But I'll tell you, in most cases, it's going to be really tough to convince them to change that recommendation or to change that, that offer because really, in reality, that's, that's their offer. <clears throat> this is something that I, is extremely important for parents to understand. Don't feel pressured to sign the IEP on the day of the meeting. Do not, in, in fact, I'd say there's Please. very few cases where it's okay to sign the IEP on the day of the I, uh, IEP meeting. No and matter how much they, they try to convince you, hey, it's okay, you know, or unless we, unless we get the signature, we can't do anything for your child, we don't want him to fall behind, um, don't, don't let them convince you to sign the IEP. Please take it home and think about it, look it over, make sure that everything that you think is in there and that you talked about in the meeting is actually in the document. Remember we talked about keeping things in writing. Oftentimes you discuss it, you sign the IEP, then you get it home and go, wait a second, we talked about three hours of speech and it only says two hours. And, and how come that's the case? And then you go back and you say, well, school district, I, I don't understand because we clearly discussed uh, that, that my child was supposed to receive three and they, and they might decide it's an error on our part and we'll, we'll correct it or they might say, well, actually, that's not what, what our agreement was. Our agreement was something else. Okay, and then you've got a situation where you've signed the IEP. Even though you have, as a parent, the right to revoke be, your signature, your consent, before that service or program is implemented, if it's been some time and, and, and you went on vacation, and, for example, that they already started implementing the service, it's, a, it's really tough if it's already been implemented by the school district to, to revoke that and to go back to the, to the old program or... Uh, to try to convince the district to change the recommendation. So take it home, think about it. There's no time frame outlined in federal law. I'm not, a, you know, at least in California, there's no time frame that a parent has to think about an IEP and get back to the district. School districts are going to tell you all kinds of things. You got 24 hours. You've got 10 school days. You've got, you know, you've got 48 hours, and we need a response. Okay. This sounds very official, and it might be, it might well be their policy that parents have 48 hours to get back, but it's not the law. There's so no take legal your time. basis. Take right. your time, think about it, digest it. You might have a lot of questions. It's, it's unlikely that a parent who shows up to an IEP meeting and sees the reports for the first time and the draft goals for the first time, even if it looks good at that time, that you really understand everything in that IEP. Okay? Plus, you want to be able to look at it later so you can see. Like a lot of times, parents will show me an IEP and say, see, it says right here. And I said, no, it doesn't. It says, Mrs. Arnold would like fast for word. Nowhere in this does it say, Mrs. Arnold's child will get fast for word. Okay, so a lot of times parents get really confused between what's in the meeting notes. Your concern is really nice, okay, but it's meaningless in the terms of the IBS list. You're just documenting something. But it should say in there, you know, Spencer will get fast for word beginning of these dates. This is what it will be, okay? And then the other reason why you want to take this home and look at it is sometimes they talk about this, and it may, maybe it says speech services three times a week. Well, what does that mean, okay? Because one of the things that Tim likes to say he'd like a dollar for every time, or even a nickel or a dime, is, oh, but he's going to be in this language-rich environment. I've just heard that so many times. Okay, so is Johnny going to get speech 15 minutes three times a week with everybody in his special day class? Or is it going to be by himself? Who's going to deliver the service? Is it going to be a speech aid, which pretty much means somebody off the street with a background check and a heartbeat? Does it mean it's going to be a speech and language pathologist? If it's going to be group, how many kids are in the group? What are the diagnoses of those children? Is it going to be with kids who have terrible... Are you going to put my kid in a speech session with kids with maladaptive behaviors? Because even if you do that for an hour, if there's kids who are maladaptive in that session, Anybody who's going to group is going to spend more time trying to deal with that, okay? And then there's the manageability of that group. How many of you have, would try to play Candyland with three neurotypical three-year-olds? Would that go well? Okay, we're talking good, perfect, classically developing children. No, you can't. What could you do with three three-year-olds, okay? Now talk about three three-year-olds with developmental disabilities, okay? 
Those are things you'll handle in your IP, and you'll want that it says on there who delivers a service, for how long, and maybe even where it's going to be, because sometimes they'll pull kids aside in a special day class, and that's not going to work for you either. And you're going to get a lot of pressure. My favorite one is, well, you know, your, your IEP is going to lapse or expire next week. IEPs do not lapse. They do not expire. You can keep the same IEP until your child ages out of the system or you move out of the district. That's a very okay. important point as well. <laughs> Don't let the district convince you that just because there's an end date that you'll stop receiving services on that end date. If you're talking about the end of the year, there's a difference between you know, extended school year and regular school year. But if we're talking about the child's services stopping in June, if there's no consent on that IEP, then that child gets the same program in September. It will continue because there's no consent by the parent to change it. The only, there's, there's, there's only a couple reasons why, why the school district can stop providing a service, one of which is if you move out of the school district, then, then another school district would have to start. Um, another is if you, you know, sign consent to change it. A third is if you get a hearing officer's decision or a judge's decision, um, and even there are circumstances where if you appeal that decision, it still has to remain status quo. Don't let them convince you that it's going to stop or that it's going to lapse or that do you want your child receiving nothing because it is unlikely, unless we're, unless we're specifically talking about the people that went to the first session, the change between the IFSP and the IEP, IEP. if we're talking about an IEP, it's unlikely that service is going to stop. That will continue um, through the next regular school year, and if it's an extended school year dispute, then whatever he got last year, if he, there's no agreement on next year, is going to remain the same. If the district tells you otherwise, talk to your State Department of Education. Let them know that the district's threatening to change it, and they'll talk to you about how to file a compliance complaint. And then on a personal note, I know a lot of moms go to IEPs by themselves, and some of the things that happen is just because mom cracks, okay? There's a lot of intense pressure. Don't you trust me? Like, aren't we like kind of girlfriends, whatever, you know? And they act like, you know, we're like going out to lunch with each other all the time, and that, you know, there's some sort of personal obligation and that it's insult to them. So what I want, for those of you who feel that kind of pressure, I want you to blame somebody else in your life. It works really well. My husband would kill me if he didn't get to see this first. My parents are really in, but my mom and dad, they say they want whatever. Make up somebody else in your life to be the bad cop. So if you have to go into an IEP with a rationale, maybe they feel like it's really adversarial that you want to tape the IEP, that you don't want to sign it whatever. Create the bad cop in your life and say, my husband can't come and he would kill me if he didn't get to listen to this first or if he didn't get to sign it himself or whatever. And that can be really effective from getting people to stop putting the screws to you about this relationship that you have and you don't trust them because those are all tactics that used car salesmen use. And when you see those, those are red flags trying to pressure you to do something that you would not do if you had more time to think about it. Take the time as well to, 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 to record your IEP by taking notes and giving notice. If, if your state has a specific requirement that you give notice 24 hours in advance, that's the way the notice requirements, it's written in California. But electronically record, tape record your IEP. Okay, there's some debate on whether you can videotape IEPs and, and certain states might have specific rules about that, but at least tape record it. So you can go home and listen to it, spend some time. We're going to talk about that. It's not in this section. I just brought it up because we're talking about making sure that you're, you have a record that you can understand, taking it home, thinking about it. Um, and just, just to, to close on this one, one uh, discussion about level, frequency, and duration, make sure it's really clear. Three times a week of speech service is not clear. We're not clear who's providing that service, whether it's a speech and language pathologist that's licensed, whether it's a credentialed speech therapist, whether it's a speech and language pathologist assistant. We're not sure who's providing this service. We're also not sure how, how much time you're actually getting. Is it three five-minute sessions? Was it three hour-long sessions? You know, 30-minute sessions, three times a week speech therapy where speech service is not adequate, okay? Make sure it's absolutely clear. Even location, like Lynn was saying about a group, how many kids in the group does that, is it three including my child? Okay, are we talking about you know, is my child the highest functioning child in this group? All right, if your child is somebody who, and, and many children with autism, would pick up or model inappropriate behaviors and appropriate behaviors, if there's a lot of kids exhibiting inappropriate behaviors in this group, is he really going to gain much of a benefit from a speech group uh, where he's going to be modeling these behaviors and bringing them back? We need to go fast now. What's that? We need to go fast now because we're running out. Okay, now we're, I'm told we need to go faster. 
Research-based me research methodologies. We talked about this earlier. Um, the, there's a, we need some, the school district is obligated to ensure that they're providing instruction to your child based on peer-reviewed research. Okay, so uh, looking at, you know, we talked about what that means. It's a method of instruction that, that there's, there's been some sort of recognized study. All right, if it's a university study, that's probably a good indication that it's a research-based program showing its effectiveness, and the school districts are required to use those methodologies to educate your child. Now, there could be a disagreement about which methodology that's research-based is appropriate for your child. They don't, the school districts are not obligated to use your selected methodology, uh, but they need to provide a justification as to why they feel their proposed methodology is appropriate for your child. And that they're actually using one. Because a lot of times they say, well, we use lots of them. We use floor time and verbal behavior, and we use this. And I think, I hope most of you know, verbal behavior and floor time are, are, are mutually exclusive, okay? If you're, you've got to use one or you've got to use another. And if your school district says, no, floor time and verbal behavior work together really great, what you want to know is, can you show me a study showing that those are effective, okay? Because you can't just go down their cafeteria list of, you know, because really what it means if they're, they're using uh, elect, eclectic, it really comes down to whatever the special day, te special day um, class teacher wants to do. So you don't just don't want a bunch of methodologies. You want to know what they're using. If they're using more than one, show me something that says it's OK to do both verbal behavior and floor time and teach um, and PECs all in one classroom setting. And if they tell you it's research-based and they, and they tell you we're using a variety of methodologies, they're required to specify that. And, and the law says to the extent possible, OK, or practical, make them specify the methodology on the IEP. Tell them that you want them to explain to you and identify it specifically in the IEP for deficit areas that are being targeted with goals and objectives. What method of research-based, uh, peer-reviewed research-based instruction are they using to remediate that area of deficit? Make sure it's listed specifically. Ask for a copy of the study that shows it's research-based. That goes back to the Colombo technique. Remember, asking the obvious. Okay, because if anybody says, this is what we're doing, this is what our policy is, this is what it's based on, that puts the burden proof on them because you say, well, thank you for telling me about that district policy. Can you give that to me in writing along with the date that the district board, the board um, approved it or whatever that study is? Because you want to let them know they could not give you too much information about what they're doing with your child at, at the school. And if it's just based on research within that particular school district, I would also... I would also say it's a bit questionable whether you yeah. should be utilizing that particular method of instruction because most school districts do not have the funding to conduct an extensive amount of research within their school district alone. They're usually drawing from university studies and I would encourage you to ask for a copy of the study. If it's a real old study, I'd also question it. Okay? Yeah, if, if it's 1981, we're going to go ahead and guess that so, something has happened between now and then. Mary Jo. We're going we're right. to save, Mary Jo, we're going to save your question for the panel discussion. With No Child Left Behind, it, it's not an enforceable statute at the parent level. It's not something that a parent could go and sue based upon. Um, you don't have a right of action under No Child Left Behind. It's really something that the federal government can use to enforce uh, laws or, or requirements as against the states, but only the feds can go that, that route. But a lot of what No Child Left Behind had incorporated one of the purposes of the IDA 04 was to, was to incorporate No Child Left Behind provisions into the IDA. So that, that to, to a lot, to a, in large part, has, they've taken a lot of NCLB and they put it into the IDA, but we can further discuss it panel. Okay. High expectations. Touched on this as well. District is required to, to make, make this program challenging for your child, okay? Don't let them set low goals or low expectations for your child. You need to challenge them. Don't let them tell you that because it's a basic floor of opportunity standard, we only have to give him limited goals or the goals need to be 
achievable, in their opinion, if you, if you add this goal, it's just too complex, it's too difficult, because if you add the complex goal, on the other end, you have a better justification for a greater or more intense level of service to help that child achieve the goal. And also, don't let them tell you those goals can stay the same. It's really frustrating to see a child who's not making any progress, and the goals are the same again next year. Okay, so remember, if the child isn't learning, we need to change the way we're teaching the child. The school is failing. We're not just going to say, Johnny's a bad kid, Susie's not smart. It means that we need to change the methodology or something in their program so they're actually achieving the goal. Or start using a methodology. Hey, how about that? Yeah. Use yeah. a methodology. Well, oh, during the panel. Yeah, you know, I, what I hear from, you know, I know we need to move along, but what I hear from teachers, or, and I've heard this in testimony when I've, when I've done due process hearings, is, it, you know what, the method is, is just good teaching. Okay. Well, we understand yeah. that, that, that that's important. It's good to, to have some experience, and if you're a 30-year teacher, you, it might just be good teaching, but it still needs to be research-based. Okay? Highly qualified staff. Going back, talking about good teaching, you, you need to have, the, the IDA requires that school districts employ people that are going to provide services to your child that, have, that are highly qualified, highly trained staff that have credentials, this is, this is a problem for, for, for California often because we have a shortage of teachers and there's a lot of people that are um, either teaching without credentials or on emergency credentials. It's still happening in California. I still get complaints from parents that I just looked up my teacher on the website and she's on an emergency credential and it's been an emergency credential for two years now. When is it going to be? I mean, and she has no experience or background in teaching a special day class and my child is in a special day class or she doesn't have a credential that's appropriate for that particular setting. She might be a teacher with a credential in a different area. So it's important that you check, and some of your states, m many of your State Department of Education websites will allow you to look up the teacher by name and check their credentials. This also becomes very significant when you're talking about uh, aid support, tutor support, somebody, a one-to-one -one shadow aid, for example, in the classroom. Is this person is this person somebody who's got a college degree? Not necessarily required, but it's nice to know that. Or are we talking about somebody who, whose last job was, you know, which is not necessarily a bad thing if this person can be trained, but their last job was working at the local fast food restaurant. They may not have a whole heck of a lot of specific training in working with children with autism. You need to know at what level. Just because they had that other job doesn't mean they can't be trained but you probably don't want them train, being trained on your, child's, on your child's time. They need to take time outside of that and put them in an intense program and train them before they start working with your child to ensure that we've got a highly qualified person providing support to your child. And don't be surprised if your district says that, well, that's, that's confidential. We don't release information about our teachers. And that's when you have to cite laws, OK? And of course, you'd also like to know what, what is that based on, because they'll say, well, we can't, we can't give any information about classified staff, or we can't, you know, we don't give resumes. You're like, well, I didn't ask for the resume, okay? What I asked you for is how is this person qualified to teach my child? I don't, I'm not asking to know, I don't, I'm not asking to tell me if she went to Michigan or Northwestern or whatever, but what are her specific experience, training, and qualifications for teaching a child who has my, my child's disabilities? This is going to be, we're going to make our best efforts after this conference to post on my website all the specific federal citations. We don't have those in every, in every point, but they exist, and we will make sure to post those. We have selected Code of Federal Regulations at the end of the book, uh, but there's a lot of th stuff we're citing, so we'd have to, this book would butt three times as big if we had to put all the law that governs for everything, every point that we're making. We didn't want to give you a site if we weren't giving you, showing you what that site is. So we'll give that to you as part of a, a PDF that you can download from my website. And the, the website is edattorneys.com, right there at the left at the bottom of the screen. And that should be available within, I'd say, about a couple of days to a week after the conference. It depends on how quickly my, my friend and, and colleague here, uh, Lynn, can get it done. So accommodations, modifications, um, another very important component of the IEP. To what extent are we providing accommodations to the child uh, or the child uh, you know, in, in the classroom? That, you know, are, are, we, are we giving him, um, a, are we adjusting the spot that he sits in the classroom? Are we providing accommodation? Are we putting him in the front of the class? Is that the accommodation? Are we, uh, we giving him some, you know, a, a, a slant board 
and a, a special type of writing in, instrument to use. You know, th these are types of accommodations you, could, you can provide to children. There's other accommodations. Um, if, if the child is, is, uh, has a physical disability, is required to be in a chair, are we, do we have a ramp to get into the classroom? That's also an accommodation. These are, these are accommodations. How, how is that different from modifications? Well, we've got, in many cases, you might have a child who's in a regular education or a general education classroom who, in many respects, is benefiting very much from his participation in that class and should be in that class. He has, but he has some aid support, perhaps, and there are, to some extent, some modifications to the curriculum. Um, and that child may not be working at the same level as all the kids, other kids in the class in a certain area. In that case, he might have some modifications to the curriculum. And to some extent, he may be doing some different work, or it may be reduced, depending on that child's needs. All that is very, is very individually based. Uh, so, so the child may not require modifications, may not require accommodations, but if he does, it needs to be specified in the IEP, and it needs to be listed. Just one more quick thing. And remember, that's cooking from scratch. I want you to consider your fantasy of what it would take to make your child successful, not what does your district already offer, okay? And that goes back to often you'll need an independent expert to tell you what assistive technologies, what would it take for your child to be successful in that placement. Okay, in this section, because now we're way over time, least restrictive environment. The IDA requires that every child be placed to the maximum extent with his, with his or her typically developing peers. Okay, so we need to first consider whether your child can be placed in a general education classroom with supplementary supports and services that can help that child be successful. Because that's the default. That okay? is the first place we're going to consider. Okay? We're not going to justify why, you don't have to justify why your child shouldn't be in a special day class. It works the other way in reverse. Let's first talk about what it would take to make your child successful in a general edge. If there were no holds barred, if, if you could have everything in the world, what would it take to make your child successful in that classroom? You work backwards from that. And only when you've made the determination that with all those things, it would be too overwhelming for your child, that the appropriate, that maybe you still, even with modifications, you don't think the curriculum would be appropriate for your child. Then you consider, then you start moving towards a more restrictive environment. Okay, so this is a really important point of law in terms of you determining where to place your child. Just because your child has a diagnosis of autism or is on the spectrum at some level does not equal autism special day class. Okay, and I, what we're seeing a lot of in, in California school districts is districts establishing model autism programs, hiring consultants, and to take children out of the general education classrooms who have aid support, which the districts are paying for six and a half hours a day with benefits, which is also can be very costly for them, to streamline the process for the district to make it more administratively convenient by putting them in the autism special day class. And in some cases, that class may be very appropriate for some kids, but that's not where you start. What, like Lynn said, you need to start considering the general education environment as the first approach. Not necessarily that you have to try it, but you need to evaluate it and discuss what's called the continuum of placements, which includes general education, special day classes, non-public school placement, non-public school or private school placement, if, if, you know, depending on your state and levels of certification. California, we call it non-public school because there's a certification process. Okay, so you can consider all those in addition to a home placement, okay? Does the child still need to be placed in the natural environment to make adequate progress, to make meaningful progress in his goals and object, in, in achieving those goals within that year's period of time? So don't, don't, don't let the school district tell you that because your child has autism, has that diagnosis, that that means that he must be in a special day class. And this goes back to asking the questions. Again, the obvious. My child doesn't talk. How would it help him to be in a classroom with lots of other kids who don't talk? Okay, you have to even start. The questions that are really obvious and common sense, you've got to get your district on the record as to why that would be a good idea because it's really, I mean, you think about it, it's really dumb to put together a bunch of kids who can't socialize and can't talk together. Your child likely needs to be with some aggressively friendly neurotypical children who are going to be in their face three times a day asking the same question the 99th time, even if though your child rejected them the previous 98 times, because aggressively friendly neurotypical kids, especially girls, there's nothing better than a bossy girl in this context, 
who's going to keep going in. And finally, when your child is ready to play, that bossy girl is going to take over. Where if your class, child's in a class where the bossy girl's not there, when they're ready, that other children may never respond. And there went some really great reinforcement that's gone. You'll never know how many opportunities were potentially lost because your child was in the wrong placement. Keep in mind that even those special day classes or autism specific classes, structured classes with teachers, they call them. Structured. Te te structured special day classes with, with a small number of students and a higher number of adults in the class, even though they, they may be appropriate, very appropriate for certain kids, it's not where you start. You need to find out if it's possible that your child be placed, not only possible according to the school district, but whether he's going to make progress in that program with supports because there is a disincentive for school districts to want to pay extra for an aide to be with the child throughout the school day if they can simply put them in the already existing special day class. It's a lot cheaper to do it that way, okay? A lot more administratively convenient. They're not going to tell you this. If you ask them, they'll probably say, no, we're, we're doing it based on your child's unique needs, but keep in mind there are other motivations, all right? So we're going to end this session. Uh, we're going to move on to, and I'm sorry, Dr. Perlman, we've taken your time. Um, okay, he's going to steal somebody else's time. All right, so we're going to move on to, to assessments. Let's take a, um, I'm going to take a, a short break. If, Two minutes and 25 seconds. Yeah, okay, we're going to start short right break. away so we can get back we're to We're really start, supposed to start at 10.